Radek, thank you so much. Um, I've really enjoyed um, being a viewer to this um, lecture series and I'm so pleased to be invited to have a chance to share some reflections on the space of targeted protein degradation and also some new data. I tried to bring some uh, new findings from our research at Novartis that I hope you find interesting and I welcome any questions at the end or, or thereafter, um, especially having trained at the Farber and um, having had eight wonderful years on faculty at the Farber, uh, it's a special pleasure to visit with you. I just wish it was in person. Um, as already shared, I have um, these disclosures to make as this is an academic setting. Um, I'm a shareholder, also serve on the executive committee of Novartis, but this will be a thoroughly scientific presentation of a research nature. And I tried for balance to include a lot of insights um, that derive from research beyond my laboratory at the Dana-Farber or um, uh, Novartis itself. Um, but I am sharing this one bias that I am all Farber all the time, pan mass rider, and still uh, carry the torch proudly. Um, this space of molecular glues is getting really hot and exciting, but it's a little bit what's old is new again um, for so many, Novartis included, that has had a long legacy in the study and in the clinical development of medicines that function as small molecule adapter proteins between two large biomolecules. Um, but I did wanna share some insights from that long legacy of study uh, and also the, the new strategies that we're taking to really understand this new class of agents. So uh, maybe a definition is required. I, I don't intend that this be a definition for the whole field. This is just the way we think about it at Nibber. Um, glues come in at least two flavors. And I'll touch on both today. Intermolecular glues, these are molecules, typically small molecules that stabilize proximity of two or even more biomolecules. Great examples of this from nature uh, would include cyclosporin A and FK506 as shown here. You can see in the crystal structure of cyclosporin A on the left, the way that the aminophilins are arranged around this um, core a macrocyclic natural product. Um, present there is cyclophilin as well as um, uh, calcineurin A and B. And this um, adapter molecule cyclosporin has of course become well, for many years now an important medicine in transplantation. I myself am a transplant doctor and have prescribed it many times. Even more have I prescribed FK506, um, which is perhaps a better tolerated but equally potent immunosuppressant that bridges calcineurin A and B to FKPP12 and other FK binding proteins. These intermolecular glues in this instance abrogate inflammatory signaling pathways in lymphocytes and other tissues. Uh, but this concept now has been engineered into many different networks to short circuit um, pathobiological protein networks typically um, with these uh, drug-like small molecules. There's another flavor of molecular glues that I think are really important, maybe under-considered, and these are intramolecular glues. These are molecules that conformationally restrict multiple domains of a single biomolecule um, through coordinated uh, bridging interactions. It could be lobes of a protein, it could be um, subtle features or um, and I'll share an example of that if we get to it in this lecture. So how do you know you're working with a glue uh, versus say a heterobifunctional protein degrader or protac? Um, one framework that we commonly use in the parlance of Nibber is that a glue does not exhibit saturable kinetics, meaning there should be no um, uh, um, competition for active sites by a second small molecule. This differentiates it from bifunctionals that exhibit this hook effect as we and others have characterized. Um, I think that a brilliant historical consideration of the space of molecular glues was just recently contributed by uh, my mentor, Stuart Schreiber, whose uh, lab I trained in as a postdoc, reflecting on the early days of these immunosuppressants at Sandoz, now an artist, um, and so many other um, elite scientific institutions um, to the present consideration of molecular glues in the context of degradation. And, and this is a, as this is a degradation meeting, maybe the bulk of this will be reflections on where we are right now in targeted protein degradation and where we might go with um, intermolecular glues. So I hope I get through each of these um, three examples. Um, 
Uh, but if the conversation directs towards one, that's okay too. So my own personal curiosity with molecular glues really began as a myeloma doctor at the Dana-Farber prescribing this remarkable new class of medicines, the thalamides, um, and where so little had helped myeloma patients since the mid-50s with melphalan and prednisone, we had these new weapons, thalidomide itself, um, lenalidomide, and ultimately pomalidomide. And these were medicines that, of course, have a very um, dark history. Um, ben Ebert from the Farber recommended this book, Dark Remedy. I know he's spoken at this group meeting before. Uh, perhaps everybody has read it, but I do highly recommend this reflection on the way that the loose chemical analogy of thalidomide to phenobarbital led to the regrettable consideration without any preclinical evidence or suggestion that these medicines, these glutaramides with thalamide conjugation might be um, sedatives. And given to women in post-war Europe, it was learned that these are potent teratogens in the first trimester. Um, this led to many important FDA reforms and later the reconsideration of this drug class through decades of phenotypic reconsideration. They emerged as modulators of immune cell signaling. It's still imperfectly understood, I think, how that works. But it was true that thalidomide and cultivated monocytes would decrease the elaboration of certain pro-inflammatory cytokines, establishing a rationale for its use in patients in inflammatory conditions like leprosy. Uh, with erythema nodosum leprosum as a one um, hallmark dermatologic manifestation. And the medicine was even approved for this use. Uh, but still, the mechanism of action of these imids was not well understood. But science soldiered on. And in the Folkman lab nearby to the Dana Farber Cancer Institute at Children's Hospital, it was learned that thalidomide uh, might retard another interesting phenotype, the proliferation of uh, retinal vessels as is commonly observed in acute macular degeneration and other tissue injury to the retina. Um, and so there was a putative activity um, for angiogenesis, which had been connected by Folkman to cancer, leading to the um, consideration of thalidomide as a multiple myeloma drug uh, brought to Bart Barlogi at the University of Arkansas by uh, Beth Jacobson, um, married to an attorney under the care of Folkman, a 35-year-old cardiologist with myeloma, Barlogi there in Little Rock bravely tried thalidomide in this patient, and though there was no clinical benefit to that man, he stuck with the idea, ultimately demonstrating through larger clinical trials with cell gene, um, remarkable activity. And now these imits have become a standard of care in that disease, an amazing progression of human phenotypic screening. Um, we have been very curious as to know how thalidomide works, a handful of us in training over at the Broad Institute. And with the advent of SILAC, ligand affinity mass spectrometry or target identification technology innovated by Xiaoanong and Steve Carr, Ralph Mazicek and I fashioned um, some patient discarded Revlimid onto polystyrene beads and went fishing in the human proteome and we didn't find anything. Um, but we were just delighted to read that Hiroshi Honda using an alkylation chemistry in a different intermediate versus the aerolamid coupling that we had pursued, was able to identify the biophysical target of thalidomide published in Science Magazine in 2010 as the Cerebron DDB1 ubiquitin ligase complex. And this got us very excited because we imagined at the time that this molecule might be inhibiting the ubiquitin ligase complex, might be blocking its transfer of ubiquitin to other substrates. But we weren't so concerned about that at the time. We were very taken in my lab with the idea that it bound cerebron at all. Meaning that perhaps by binding cerebron on a polystyrene bead with a linker, we could drag this ubiquitin ligase complex around cells degrading protein targets of interest using heterobifunctional small molecule degraders. Um, so as to redirect cerebron to a physiologic or even therapeutically relevant substrates. And, there's a strong rationale to protein degradation that attendees to this lecture series certainly don't need me to recite, but I've listed some of them here. And why I remain so excited about protein degraders is the potential access to intractable proteins, difficult to drug proteins. You see, in most of medicinal chemistry, our monosynaptic strategy for inhibition is to bind to and disrupt active sites, like so successful has been our and other um, in, uh, innovation of in selective inhibitors for kinases. Sometimes the druggable part of a protein isn't the active site. And then what do you do? So there's this possibility maybe to bind and degrade 
in spaces where you can't easily inhibit. And, and but the space of molecular glues, perhaps even, you don't even have to bind a protein at all through your small molecule. Rather, the small molecule completes an interface created as an ensemble between the small molecule and the surrounding protein surfaces, recruiting proteins that would just be purely undruggable through any other consideration. And that's a molecular glue. Again, one that doesn't have saturable kinetics. The other reason we're really excited about degraders is that they might be stronger than inhibitors to take out all the multiple domains of a protein. And then third, the pharmacology might be different, that the durable impact of degradation can only be overcome by cellular signaling with reconstitution of the protein itself, therefore uncoupling pharmacokinetics with durable pharmacodynamics. Um, well, I think it's also, um, as an industry scientist, now worth reflecting that this idea um, was first conceived of in industry by um, um, two discovery scientists, uh, Kenton and Roberts, who even patented the concept of making molecules that bridge the ubiquitin ligase system with targets of interest. But they never did get it working. And there, the seminal work of Cruz and Deshaies using peptidyl fragments of HIF2-alpha and, and engineered solutions sometimes in Xenopus extracts established in their seminal contribution to PNAS, this idea of protax by functional molecules that can degrade proteins on command. Um, but there was something holding the field back, uh, even from this conceptual framework and early suggestive evidence that it could work. And, and that is that peptides are hard, they're big, they don't penetrate cells, they're not drug-like. I've been down that road with staple helices. And what was really needed were chemical solutions that would lead to facile cell penetration and use in vivo where so many, so much interesting biology happens um, these days. And um, thanks to the discovery of Honda, um, a group of uh, scientists in my lab, then at the Dana-Farber, Georg Winter on the left, Dennis Buckley on the right, uh, created a first chemical solution to protein degradation that we and others have found so enabling. Um, at the time, there were these many technological challenges that it was engineering, it was peptides, there wasn't much in the way of characterization biochemically, low potency in the mid to high micromolar range. We didn't even really know if these things were selective or not. And so I'm um, in a study that I'm sure most have some familiarity with, so I'll just browse through this quickly and get to the good stuff. Um, we ticked off a lot of these boxes. We created bifunctional molecules to target the BRD4 bromodomain containing protein that we were so curious about mechanistically in transcriptional uh, elongation and proximal promoter pause release. And with this bifunctional molecule and the alkylated thalamate that you see here, we were able to achieve um, potent recruitment of both the Cerebron DDB1 complex as well as BRD4. Um, solve the crystal structure of this bifunctional degrader in BRD4. And you could see we lost atomic resolution in this linker domain purposefully created to bridge and recruit the ligase, leading to really unprecedented potent and selective degradation um, of BRD2, 3, and 4, the intentional targets among 7,000 proteins queried. And this molecule worked in vivo, which we thought was quite um, exciting because we could test its putative utility as an um, an early proof of concept molecule for anti-leukemia therapy. And the reviewers of science were tough. Um, I was in review for a while and they said, you know, this is amazing, but do it again, <laughs> which is kind of harsh. And so we did do it again. Uh, we went back and um, as BRD4 is principally a nuclear protein, we degraded the cytosolic protein FKBB12 with a series of ligands of um, increasing potency that allowed us to establish rough guidance as to the thresholds necessary um, for this new brand of pharmacology at about 150 nanomole or cellular binding energy at equilibrium. But as the bromodomain lab, we couldn't help but try this chemistry out on other bromodomain containing proteins. And the field of chemical biology and SGC in particular had created a number of small molecule binders to bromodomains, but most of these were not terribly active in cellular assays that the bromodomain uh, perceived as being relevant for its capacity to bind acetylated lysine and nuclear euchromidin uh, maybe didn't have as much relevance to cell biology as, say, the acetyl transferase domain of CBP and P300 or the ATPase domain of BRD, uh, BRG1 um, and BRM. And so um, scientists in the group uh, took um, ineffectual or low potency uh, bromodomain binders and turned them into quite potent degraders. We did this with BRD9, taking initially a non-selective BRD9 uh, binder 
and turning it into quite a selective BRD9 degrader, validating that target in leukemias, myeloid leukemias. Uh, with TRIM24, we took um, uh, a peptidyl fragment from Leso Chuli's work, um, from Dennis Buckley's uh, PhD thesis work, and appended it to a TRIM24 bromodomain binder, creating a, a nice degrader. And, and GSK did the same thing. I thought it a beautiful study of GCN5, where the bromodomain binder does nothing at all, but as a degrader to both PCAF and GCN5, a selective degrader therein, they could block inflammatory signaling. So um, the field's moving really fast, and I thought I might just share um, some emerging themes or truisms that we're starting to see replicated um, in the literature. First, this is just like a surgical strike. For some reason, we by and large degrade the protein target of the small molecule, but we don't degrade all the other proteins associated with that target protein. There are some exceptions, but they're very few, and I find all of them very interesting. Um, Panagis, Filipopoulos, and colleagues show that BRD4 might bind to 60 proteins in the cell, but only three proteins are degraded, and those are the direct biophysical targets of the recruiting ligand. Sagal Kadoch at the Farber showed that there are you know, 30 or more components to the non-canonical BAF complex that contains BRD9, but we only degrade BRD9 with our BRD9-directed degrader. And perhaps there's some insight there about the geometrical uh, geometric restrictions with ubiquitin transfer, as we uh, brilliantly discussed at the last TPD um, um, seminar series here, and is also truly well discussed in his elegant talk. Um, it's fair to say we're learning more and more about the uh, geometry of ubiquitin transfer through these small molecules, um, but they appear to be quite selective um, to the protein engaged. Second, um, is that these are like little molecular catalysts. Um, we showed for the first time using paired cell lines, um, uh, TALL cell lines that did or didn't have the ubiquitin ligase cerebron, that um, these degraders without cerebron behave like bromodomain inhibitors. But in the presence of cerebron, there's a two to three log shift towards increased potency. Uh, this is of course because the small molecule is not degraded, but the protein target is and has led to even sub-nanomolar degraders for BRD4, so potent that many out there are now considering them um, as substitutes for natural products in antibody drug conjugate um, design. Um, this sub stoichiometric shift is really exciting, but also gives me the chills a little bit because once you're in sub stoichiometric degradation space, um, you have to really worry about off-target effects that would therefore also be potentially sub stoichiometric. More on that in a minute. We know now that uh, degradation is very different than inhibition. We should have known that because there are a lot of things that hairpins do that small molecules directed at protein targets don't. Uh, but the JQ1 bromodomain inhibitor causes a cytostatic response while the degrader causes a cytotoxic response, the first clue. But as we characterized in a molecular cell paper a couple of years ago, the transcriptional consequence of inhibition versus degradation of BRD4, we learned something quite fundamental about BRD4 for very much the first time that if inhibition of BRD4 downregulates these um, short half-life or super enhancer associated genes, BRD4 degradation wipes out all of productive transcriptional elongation. Establishing BRD4 as we did in this study with Sterling Churchman as a master um, elongation factor, um, licensing the CDK9 PTFB complex to license RNA polymerase for proximal promoter pause release. So these small molecules can be really elegant temporal probes for mechanistic cell biology. We've learned that ligand specificity does not often direct to greater selectivity. And we keep learning this over and again. The first insight came from our work with BRD9 where the BRD9 binder we were using would also bind to BRD4 and BRD7, but the degrader would only degrade BRD9, which was interesting. We followed up on this with Nathaniel Gray um, uh, in transition from the Farber to Stanford and hello, Nathaniel and colleagues, where we took some of the most non-selective kinase inhibitors we could find that literally light up the kinome by kinome scan binding assays, but that degrade only a small number of kinases. Perhaps there are geometric reasons for this, accessibilities of lysines, accessibilities of proteins, turnover rates, probably many factors, uh, but we have been inspired by this to reconsider old chemical equity where we failed to engender adequate selectivity and, um, and give these projects new life as degraders. 
we have a handful of those in our in our pipeline now. Um, Protein degradation chemistry can be good for tar target identification. Target identification can be really challenging. If ligand um, affinity chromatography doesn't work, um, it can be really challenging. We had a sunitinib derivative that we made to degrade FLT3, and it just killed these FLT3 mutated leukemia cells. We were so excited about this. But when we looked for the protein consequences of this small molecule using kinase-enriched uh, proteomics, we didn't find any kinases degraded. And this was kind of a bummer. So we did the project again. Uh, we didn't find any kinases degraded. And so we did shotgun proteomics and found that this intended kinase degrader uh, potently degrades GSPT1. And um, this would be um, a sort of a, a toxic consequence of this molecule contributed not as it turns out by sunitinib at all, but by the ensemble of the cerebellum binding feature and its appended linker. And so one might take a small molecule of, ph of phenotypic interest and consider it as a degrader. And maybe you'd find a new protein of interest uh, mediate, mediating that phenotype. And one such paper was uh, brilliantly contributed just last week in the chemical biology literature. Um, what do you do if you don't have a ligand for a protein of interest? What if you kind of want to ask the question, is the juice worth the squeeze? Or, or you want to validate a target um, before undertaking discovery? And so Benan Nabed in my lab, now um, completing his um, research with uh, Nathaniel Gray, created a really cool technology I'm sure most on this call know all about called the DTAG technology. And we had the idea that we would leverage this bump hole relationship um, with the um, AP1497 chemical series that has a bump um, and then build um, the established hole into FKBP12, um, the F36 uh, valine mutant that accommodates uniquely um, this um, halogenated derivative of AP1497 from uh, Claxon's work at Ariad Pharmaceuticals. And then this little 12 kilodalton open rating frame can be uh, engineered as a chimera at the amino or carboxy terminus um, leading to um, selective degradation of, of only that protein of interest. And um, this has been very helpful to our work to validate targets pharmacologically um, and to understand the fast biology downstream of um, fast acting proteins. Um, as reported, so I won't go too far into it, we became interested in the Yates domains that also bind acetylated lysine, structurally dissimilar from the four alpha helical bundle of the Broma domains, um, and whether any of them might be involved in transcriptional uh, pause release, and if any of them might be interesting as blood cancers targets. And we focused on ENL. And using DTAG, we could selectively degrade ENL. I hope you can see my cursor as shown in the upper right. Um, and the bump hole was working as we did not degrade cytosolic FKBP12. And now with this chemical tool to only interfere with one protein in the cell, we could ask questions like, do cancers depend on ENL for their viability as this IC50 curve shows? And then what are the downstream transcriptional consequences of losing a master elongation factor like ENL. And this pointed us in the direction of a core circuitry of cell specifying and state defining uh, transcriptional regulators. Um, it could be handy to have versions of DTAG that work not just with Cerebon, but with other ubiquitin ligases. And so we've recently, just recently reported uh, Benam's work to develop a VHL dependent DTAG system. And now with a host of small molecules that bind VHL, as um, miniaturized peptidyl derivatives of the HIF2 alpha. You can see the vestigial hydroxyproline in these structures. Um, Benam's elegant work um, has created a series of molecules that are um, themselves um, um, stereochemical pairs, active and inactive, um, to uh, allow the study of target-directed degradation now via Cerebon or VHL. And these probes, importantly, as shown in the lower right, work in vivo, um, leading to the fast, profound, efficient and durable degradation of proteins of interest. And uh, Badam has um, re uh, remarkably made these available to scientists around the world. Back in 2014, we got excited about this, um, this DTAG technology as maybe being therapeutically relevant. Um, at this time, CAR T cell therapy was emerging as a very active um, cellular therapy for blood cancers, in particular B-cell leukemias and lymphomas. And we were caring for some of these patients at the Dana-Farber and following the work of Carl June and others with incredible admiration. 
Uh, but many of these patients um, in, uh, in Seattle on Juno studies and others were having um, severe neurotoxicity. And so we imagined a capacity to use DTAG to turn off the protein payload in a way that would abrogate this toxicology, but wouldn't actually kill the CAR T cells so as not to interfere with the uh, persistence of the CAR T. So important, we believed at the time and now know um, to contribute meaningful logarithmic um, uh, tumor reduction and durable clinical responses. Um, so um, uh, we um, uh, cloned um, two CAR T cells um, uh, um, targeting vectors directed at CD19, but with um, two different flavors of intracellular um, CD3 activating domains. One built on NKG2D and, and the other is the traditional um, UPenn Novartis Chimera. And what Banam showed is that if you put the DTAG on the um, extracellular surface, of course, you don't degrade. But if you put it intracellularly, then, then you actually can't quite potently degrade here with these cerebellum degraders. Um, and this work, I believe, was licensed um, to C4 Therapeutics, which we started out of our lab in 2015. Um, in truth, at um, Novartis now innovating CAR T cell therapies, we haven't for the blood cancer therapies, at least as um, we use our constructs, um, needed uh, post-translational degradation uh, capacity, uh, but perhaps bringing CAR T cell therapy more broadly into solid tumors, um, these types of approaches could be really useful. And so I think it's an area to keep your eye on. We surely do. Um, but Banam has uh, um, been very generous to follow the example of chemical probes and um, from the Dana-Farber chemical biology groups, ours included, and make this broadly available, he even wrote a how-to document. Um, and um, I learned the other day that there are 800 um, now distributions of these vectors um, and uh, many, many of the small molecules. And so we hope that the number of studies that we see across biology using the DTAG system to grow, and it's super cool. I hope this um, works well over um, this medium, but here's a DTAG on a GFP, but not on an RFP. And, and you can see the way that this allows the study of really, really rapid biology in vitro and in vivo. We've learned through all of this that um, ligases have some substrate preferences. Um, we tried to degrade the TRIM24 protein with a TRIM24 bromodarine directed small molecule. And initially we worked off of cerebellum and we could not degrade TRIM24. Um, but by pivoting to a VHL recruiting by functional molecule, we could. And that was a good learning. Um, there are now binders to probably 12-ish uh, ubiquitin ligase complexes um, that discovery chemists and chemical biologists can work with. Um, I think there's still a need for, for others, um, but here the appending VHL binding ligand was really important to create um, a bioactive degrader of TRIM24, which we use to invalidate the target in breast cancer, but to suggest the target in blood cancers. We've learned that ligases have confirmational preferences. And as you have Eric Fisher there and had Alessio out recently, I won't go deep on this, but suffice it to say, that through linkerology, um, we together have been able to achieve remarkable selectivity for only degrading BRD4 um, with molecules that have been always very non-selective between BRDs two, three, and four. And we worked for many years with a bunch of graduate students and postdocs to try to get selective BRD4 only antagonists, couldn't do it. But with the geometry perhaps of this degradation chemistry, um, we arrived at ZXH 3-26, which is, I think, really the first truly selective degrader of BRD4 across a several logarithmic range consistently in many different cell types. And that's a really useful chemical tool because of, other than with DTAG and hairpins, we haven't really been able to ask the question, what's BRD4-specific biology versus, say, BRD2 and 3? We learned that like Ligases can degrade ligases. This hybrid molecule um, was able to degrade MDM2 itself, ubiquitin ligase, through cerebellum recruitment. Jan Kronke made this really cool suicidal molecule that causes cerebellum to digest itself. And um, Kronke then made the molecule where VHL goes over and degrades cerebellum and not the other way around, if that's a window perhaps into the pleiotropic degradation capacity of VHL. Um, and that's cool because there are a lot of really interesting ubiquitin, interesting ubiquitin ligases implicated in human disease. 
We've learned that resistance is quite polygenic. Um, Data Farber's own Constantine Mitziaitis uh, reported this week with some help from folks from our lab um, that there are any number of opportunities for evasive resistance to small molecule bifunctional degraders used as anti-cancer drugs. And Gary Winter had published just earlier um, that um, a, a really gorgeous study looking at multiple different targets and multiple different ligases that the CRL UPP system just lights up um, in forward chemical genetic studies of uh, pathway directed, in this case, CRISPR hairpins um, selection for cellular clones that can grow through the pressure of these um, ligase directed small molecules um, is quite easy to achieve. And this has been the clinical experience as well. Though the IMIDs are profoundly important for multiple myeloma, um, as in the literature recently, there was a gorgeous um, study of somatic alterations to cerebron that are associated clinically with progression on lenalidomide. Um, and this is just a cautionary tale that even epigenetic downregulation of some of these pathway members could lead to evasive resistance. This work um, has proven quite extensible and feels super real right now. Um, our Venus has made a cerebron directed BRD4 degrader. Alessio, um, as hopefully he shared, has made a BRD4 degrader off VHL. Craig has recently contributed a, a degrader for BRD4 that uses um, recruitment of, of MDM2. And um, uh, BRD4 has kind of come out as sort of like the testing or the proving ground for a lot of different um, uh, degraders, which cracks me up because um, as I was so new to chemistry, when I started the lab, people always called BRD4 a, a target so easy to inhibit even um, an oncologist can do it. And maybe now it's the target so easy to degrade even Brenner could do it. Um, together with Dan Nomura at Berkeley, we've created a center for covalent chemoproteomics where we're mapping the ligandable cysteines in the human proteome so as to build a reference uh, for starting points for ligand discovery across um, the eight or more disease areas uh, where we um, develop medicines at Novartis. This work has been um, super fruitful also to find novel irreversible binders to ligases and Ben Cravat and many others are doing this as well. But uh, recently reported, we've now found um, small molecules that bind RNF-114 as the nimbolide natural product does. And I know Dan's had a chance to come. It's just a growth industry, you guys. You know, there's so many great uh, contributions to the literature. It's really thrilling to see this chemistry take on. And um, there's just publications everywhere. There's, you know, like, um, two dozen drug companies, billions of dollars being invested. And all of this makes us very hopeful that there'll be really new therapeutics rising. Um, so back to GLUES and Novartis, we started when I joined in 2016, a targeted protein degradation initiative that would be really nimble and inviting. Um, it's sort of like an open sandbox to experiment with this chemistry and it's recruited the attention of a lot of scientists from different disease areas. And we build a toolbox of assays, methodologies, proteomic capacities, and importantly, small molecules that scientists can access to you know, really quickly get to second base and have a molecule that works proof of concept in their cellular system. Um, but we need to go into a drug-like direction and always trying to look around the next corner. In 2016, we put a really asymmetric um, emphasis and resource into uh, molecular glues. And we actually now have four molecular glues in human clinical investigation. Uh, two are what one might call intermolecular glues and two are intramolecular glues. And I'll refer to a couple of them in the closing moments here. Um, it's been great to have Nico Tome at Novartis at the Friedrich Miescher Institute is one of our research institutes at the Novartis Institute. And I know Nico and um, Eric have um, lectured in this series and insights from Phil have supported this idea that bi orally bioavailable small molecules can recruit proteins like Icarus transcription factors that nobody would have seen coming. And I want to acknowledge the contributions um, of Bill Kalin to this work at the Farber as well, uh, with whom we reported in 2014. Um, the surprising finding that small molecule binders of cerebellum don't inhibit, but they actually confer a gain of function capacity to the great Icaros, and that Ben Ebert's lab um, concurrently uh, reported and uh, markedly extended these findings, um, establishing even a primary structural rationale um, to that mode of action. I want to acknowledge Eric Fisher's really important contributions that um, build on the suggestive evidence that SAL4, the causative um, human um, developmental gene associated with Okahiro syndrome 
a syndrome that looks an awful lot like focomelia um, attributable to thalidomide toxicity um, um, might be the, um, the teratogenic consequence of thalidomide. And, and we and so many others believe that it is um, and build molecules now so as not to have this capacity. Um, we recently reported a, a new sort of DTAG system um, called the HILDTAG system that uses um, IMIDs and then a much, much smaller DTAG than um, even the 12 kilodalton FKDP12, one based on Icaros, um, and showed how this DTAG might be useful to build a safer CAR T cell, as I've already shared. And um, want to acknowledge um, the brilliant work of Max and others who presented at this series. And that was also so exciting to hear how both an on and an off switch have been considered um, with this biochemistry now um, in the Ebert lab, collaborating with Marcel at MGH. Really cool stuff. At C4, um, surely independent of any contribution of mine, um, this is not a collaboration with C4, but C4 has created um, an A tag, an Achilles tag, as they call it. Um, here using MTH1 um, and direct acting small molecule binders that in the lone animal arrange lead to degradation capacity considered in this presentation from Rami Zid, a graduate of our lab, as another potential solution to open up the therapeutic index of CAR-T. I actually am really excited about all of these technologies because we're heavily invested in AAV gene therapy and in cell progenitor, stem progenitor cell therapy at Novartis. And having pharmacologic control over protein payloads and gene therapy, it's actually a really big deal. So um, I think we should see, probably not in CAR T cells, but in other applications of gene therapy, um, the use of post-translational switches just like these, if not these. Um, our studies at Novartis are, are maturing really quite nicely, as I mentioned with the four clinical programs. It's not all we do. And so we've had to be really choiceful about where we make research investments. and. In total, I would say we have probably about eight projects um, trending towards clinical investigation and maybe a dozen sort of exploratory projects. And so I'd like to think we're really leaders in certain aspects of it, like the glues, but we are also very interested to partner with other groups that are making uh, great contributions in this widely democratized area of TPD and molecular glues. Um, recently, we had a chance to report um, uh, Dirk, Jonathan, and Josh, and others from our lab um, at Nibber, um, the structural basis for the surprising um, glue-like activity of the sulfonamides in Dusalam. Um, and here, um, as Eric Fisher has brilliantly reported as well, um, we find these sulfonamide small molecules um, really don't have demonstrable binding constants to this machinery, but like a molecular glue should uh, facilitate the assembly of DCAF-15 with RRM proteins like RBM-39 and RBM-23. We haven't been as lucky to really deduce a structural degron as we have with Icaros for this work, um, but we do think that it's just another sign that molecular glues are everywhere. You just have to look for them. We really wanted to find them in an intentional way though. And so um, uh, Greg Michaud in our chemical biology and therapeutics group um, and this is paper's just been submitted uh, uh, for consideration for publication, has um, uh, created a series of molecules that bind VHL and may or may not have glue. So instead of finding these sort of accidentally, can we find these you know, purposefully? And so with a library of molecules that bind VHL that have a chemical diversification pre-built in, and with a series of um, um, protein arrays, um, that, have, that present um, um, baculovirus um, uh, prepared uh, proteins or protein folds, and then can be incubated with small molecules and the VHL purified minimal machinery, Greg and colleagues have been able to find glue-like activity, potent glue-like activity of multiple small molecules for several different protein targets. And most notably and best validated is cysteine deoxygenase one that lit up on this array with a handful of these small molecules. We find as one would expect for a degrading glue that um, there is no binding constant really to CDO1, but that this molecule profoundly influences the capacity of CDO1 to bind VHL and thus no hook like um, activity. Um, this molecule by, uh, degrades in a manner that depends on the VHL ubiquitin ligase that's blocked by proteasome inhibition, as well as inhibition of the is so brilliantly considered at the last presentation. 
We've solved the high resolution crystal structure of CDL1 bound into VHL. Um, and it's just gorgeous. It's sort of like shades of cyclosporin A again, where this now extended peptidyl molecule is able to um, create a um, host of principally elect um, hydrophobic um, uh, invagination um, uh, compatibilities with CDO1, but there are also important um, electrostatic bridging interactions as well, both with CDO1 and VHL. And so in this way, this compound five in this case, it needs a cooler name, um, is really itself sort of a non-covalent post-translational modification of VHL that leads to altered specificity and recruitment. Um, this ternary complex formation we think is pretty cool. Um, it may or may not be a structural degron, um, but it has encouraged us to think of VHL as a framework for additional molecular glues that we might more intentionally build and direct. Um, I use this funny term serendegrity. I'm, I'm desperate for this not to catch on in the scientific world, but really, um, you know, the clinical validation of targeted protein degradation is so firmly established by medicines like fulvestrant here called ICI that for whatever reason degrade estrogen receptor alpha, arsenic trioxide that for whatever reason degrades PMLRER alpha, and of course the imids that for a very clear structural reason degrade. And we're seeing serendegrity everywhere. Um, lead series that now instead of optimized for inhibitory capacities and binding and homogeneous assays are considered as maybe degraders. Um, and we're getting really systematic at Novartis now for certain programs to always be sure to ask the question periodically in MedChem, do any molecules in this series degrade? And I'd bet dollars to donuts that, um, that um, uh, um, fulvestrin is a, a glue degrader to some ubiquitin ligase. Um, recently, there are three just gorgeous findings, of, again, of serendegrity. Um, here, the amazing simultaneous discovery from um, three groups globally, um, many friends on these papers, that cyclin K via CDK12 engagement can be degraded even without the cerebellon adapter, but through DDB1 itself. Serendegrity is everywhere. So when to degrade? Um, this community hopefully is a community that will reach for the highest hanging fruit and not like, you know, get distracted by the opportunistic kinase this, kinase that um, degrading. I think especially in these pandemic times, I think about degrading coronavirus proteins and those with ligands, we'd be very motivated to help build degraders if you lack that capacity. Um, I like the idea of degrading multi-domain proteins as shared, but I really like extending this into undruggable space. Um, and the proteins that um, we have made degraders for into human clinical investigations so far are really proteins that I think you'd have a hard time inhibiting or degrading without this um, new mode of molecular glue chemistry. Um, there are a lot of challenges, and I phrase these as opportunities because in an academic audience, I think if you can reduce any of these to facile practice, it's just like the rising tide that makes everything better. Uh, in particular, and Eric, I hope you're on this call. Roddick, please take it back. We need better multiplexing capacity in proteomics, like yesterday. Um, frequently, biology is the slow step in drug hunting. Sometimes it's chemistry, but here it's protein sciences. In closing, I want to give you a couple of snapshots. Um, intermolecular glues go well beyond protein degradation. For spinal muscular atrophy, just a horrific neurodegenerative disease that is lethal in children with SMA type 1, for which at the time there was no available therapy. Um, scientists at Nibber um, considered that there could be small molecules that would um, lead to exon 7 retention in SMN2, unaltered in spinal muscular atrophy that would compensate with more productive protein expression from an exon 7 retained mRNA, compensating for SMN1 loss and using a series of really elegant signal on phenotypic screening assays discovered in millions of compounds studied, a small number of small molecules um, with consistent core pharmacophores that led to SMN2 um, enhanced um, exon retention and protein production. And this ultimately led to um, the just elegant medicinal chemistry. Um, believe me, each of these arrows have thousands of, of associate hours embedded um, to LMIO70, the first ever small molecule that in a sequence specific manner um, corrects um, uh, exon 7 splicing. And we've characterized now this molecule exhaustively 
Um, and this molecule, believe it or not, um, does not bind to a protein in a demonstrable way, ligand affinity chromatography was dead negative, but rather has a sequence specific stabilization of the uh, pre-spliced RNA on the U1 SNRP. It's a molecular glue that only binds its protein target in the presence of this RNA, stabilizing the RNA. This is now a structural model um, leading to this restorative protein consequence. Um, this molecule is in human clinical investigation. Molecules inspired by this by PTC and Roche um, are now seeking regulatory approval for SMA and have it in some jurisdictions. Um, this medicine has reversed the trend in early clinical studies of decline of the hallmark clinical characteristics of SMA, actually leading to um, um, milestones achieved by these children. We've recently characterized the consequences of LMA's action across all of the mRNAs and splicing events in human biology that we can, and it's exquisitely selective. We have found remarkably, and this is unpublished data submitted for publication, but I've not previously shared it, that LMI 070 in the way that it stabilizes the, um, uh, the pre-spliced mRNA of SMN2, it actually destabilizes mutant Huntington transcript. Um, and in model cell lines that have been workhorses for us for Huntington's disease drug discovery, and in patient-derived fibroblasts, we have observed a decrease in mutant Huntington um, RNA stability and expression. We have now validated this in patient-derived samples um, from the um, spinal muscular atrophy study. And this medicine is entering into advanced clinical trials um, as potentially oral therapy for Huntington suppression in that horrible disease. I didn't have time to talk about intramolecular glues, but our best example I did share at a grand rounds at the Farber previously. Here, um, protein phosphatases have never been successfully approached by Discovery Chemistry, and we have reported and innovated the very first ever a bona fide phosphatase inhibitor as a therapeutic um, product. And here we target SHIP2 because it is a, a requisite signaling feature, a tyrosine phosphatase in so many oncogenic tyrosine kinase pathways. And it's also um, an important facilitator collaborator of KRAS signaling, in particular KRAS G12C. We and others have made very potent inhibitors of phosphatases by looking at only the singular phosphatase domain. The problem is the anionic nature of those molecules binding to the cationic pocket that recognizes phosphates don't make for great uh, medicines. And so we reconsidered this with the full ensemble of domains um, in a high throughput screen that threw out all phosphatase directed inhibitors, but retained small molecules that bound that worked only in the context of all three domains, the protein tyrosine phosphatase domain, as well as the two SH2 regulatory domains. Um, together with Mike Eck and our own internal scientists, we've characterized these molecules. They are intramolecular glues that function by bridging a coordinated lattice of electrostatic interactions at an allosteric site on the phosphatase domain, but binds only in the presence of the two SH2 domains. And through really elegant ligand efficient lead optimization, we have matured this amino pyrimidine core to um, optimize pi stacking interactions in one case that are critical to this chlorophenyl ring. Um, this Eastern papyrazine was thought not to be pivotal. We, as you can see, added this extra cyclic basic amine to pick up an order of magnitude of activity and ultimately spun the nitrogens around the heterocycle to optimize a, a pi cationic interaction with arginine 111. That's a long-winded way of saying really first world med chem that led to a very potent and active lead molecule. How does it work? This is a simulation um, from a morph structure, but the molecule binds directly into this central channel and ultimately bridges all three domains. It's non-saturable. This is an intramolecular glue. It just happens to be the proteins recruited are within a singular open reading frame. Its binding leads to invasion of this green loop into the active site that ultimately blocks catalytic function. And here you can see those bridging electrostatic interactions. 
It's because of this exquisite pharmacology that it's so selective for SHIP2 and not SHIP1, where a more open pore, as shown in the lower middle of this panel, um, leads to water just flushing this molecule out of the active site. We completed medicinal chemistry. Um, this is just a masterclass paper if you should read it in JMedChem, ultimately realizing TNO155 that is advancing alone and in combination clinical trials. And Data-Farber is a very important site for this clinical investigation. I want to give you one sneak peek of data I've not presented previously um, of where this molecule might have huge clinical impact. You might know that first covalent molecules have been developed now for the G12C allele of KRAS uh, by at least six companies, ours and others, um, and that these molecules are heading into clinical investigation as single agents, and that Amgen has recently approached um, a point where they might receive full regulatory consideration with a high objective response rate as a single agent. Unfortunately, these patients are not cured. And so for this, as for other targeted therapies, we need a mechanistic basis for combination agents. And uh, published studies and unpublished studies have converged on SHIP2 as being important for G12C cycling and an opportunity for um, combination therapy that could anticipate evasive resistance. Um, this study is open and enrolling, but recently um, collaborators of ours at Marathi, who've innovated a G12C inhibitor, uh, presented um, this clinical experience of a patient, a 53-year-old smoker um, who was diagnosed with non-small cell lung carcinoma, who received the Amgen KRAS G12C inhibitor, um, progressed, uh, was enrolled on the Marathi G12C inhibitor in combination with our um, SHIP2 drug. Um, and at active uh, um, dosing levels of both medicines, this patient has had an extraordinary response. It's a maturing story. We're so hopeful that this medicine will be well tolerated and it will be consistently active in this disease. And we appreciate the collaboration with the Dana-Farber uh, to move this concept of G12C SHIP2 therapy along. In closing, um, we may be at the end of undruggable. <laughs> I hate that word. Um, Maybe intractable is a little bit better, um, but listen, if you can drug RNA in a sequence specific way with small molecule glues that recruit the U1 SNRP, both to stabilize and destabilize you know, um, um, transcripts, um, then nothing's undruggable. It's just on us uh, to reimagine what it means to be a therapeutic um, and its likeness. Um, and anyway, thanks for the invitation to join. I'll take any questions if you have them. Uh, it's wonderful to be back here at Dana-Farber. Believe it or not, five years now, my anniversary at Nibber. And thanks to all of you uh, for your heroic work um, taking care of cancer patients during the impossible times of this pandemic. Um, take any questions. Thank you.